What they should be doing is they should be establishing at least two English-based and degree-granting programs, one an undergrad, one <clears throat> a postgrad. Uh, they should be looking to increase the number of international faculty members and visiting scholars, also increasing the number of international students, okay? And they were to be also taking in more students in the fall, right? We all know the problem, or the, the challenge of, you know, a, a, a year that begins in April, okay? And most of the, at least, Western world is starting in the fall, okay? So we've got, a, we've got a problem here with when students can come to Japan. So there is this desire that they should be uh, you know, taking more students in the fall, and that might help with this, okay? Well, you know, the Global 30 project is actually a, a Global 13 reality, so those of you who know the 13 and 30 problem and the 17 and 70 problem and 19 and 90 problem that Japanese speakers have, okay, it's kind of a... Uh, but this is the way it panned out. Uh, again, a lot of numbers, so I'll... I'll and I'm, I'm happy to share this presentation with anybody if you want afterwards, if you want me to email it to you, that's fine. Uh, but again, uh, you can see the ambitious total, uh, the grand total, you know, trying to move it, okay, from 16,000 now in 2008 to, by 2020, 50,000 students going to these, just, to these 13 institutions. Okay, I'm particularly struck by Waseda. Uh, trying to go from 2,600 students to 8,000 international students. Uh, that's a very ambitious goal. That's a very ambitious goal. The other thing about this, as I put down at the bottom, uh, APU Ritsumeikan, which is located in Beppu, uh, International Christian University, and Akita International University were actually disqualified from this project. Okay, they're already too successful. <laughs> <Right>. No, <laughs> they weren't counted. They weren't allowed to apply for this. Okay, because they already had programs in place. So again, what does that tell you about the priorities and the disconnect between what is happening with the practitioners, okay, uh, and then those who are trying to implement a policy that is not in step with what is actually going on uh, in international education. So, you know, 17 spots remain unfilled, and the consensus I have from my friends that work throughout Japan is that they will remain that way. We're only going to be uh, with 13 students, uh, 13 institutions in that way. Um, you know, another criticism that, you know, yes, they're setting up these English programs, but, you know, there's merely, you know, a, a show of it, okay? It's not really a depth to it, right? Um, you know, an, another thing is, you know, the, the looming debt, okay? Really, you know, where is this money going to come from, okay? How are these institutions going to be able to? I know a lot of my friends, uh, you know, applying for uh, faculty positions at so-called G30 institutions. And I've kind of warned them, and I've said, you know, this money is already running out. You might not have a position <laughs> in a couple of years. So you've got to be very careful as to what is going on. And when, you know, Osaka University says we've got uh, a new Global 30 program, do they really understand where this money is going to come from? So a lot of pressure is being put on institutions. They've got the seed money, but now you've got to be able to develop that program on your own after five years because the government isn't going to come in and help you out anymore with that. Okay. Okay. Um, to take you back, just briefly, and again, we won't, we won't go through the numbers, but again, I remember I told you there's only 66 programs right now, okay? And we look at the national university, we've got 30 of them. Again, this is from that, uh, that, that outline from the MEX, and they categorize them as such that, you know, about 50 short-term students, or about 30 short-term students. Now, Otaru has about 20, okay, short-term students, okay, and as well as Chiba University, uh, Kumamoto, and so on, okay. As we move to the, the private uh, institutions, okay, uh, 35, and yes, Musashi is listed. Uh, we are right here. We're, we're in the category of about 20, 20, 20 to 30, okay, which again, when you're trying to figure out, you know, what that actually means, it's very confusing, okay. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, Kansai Gaidai, 400 uh, students, okay? Uh, Waseda, 200 students, and all the way down. So again, trying to give you a definition of a small program, that's again why I'm saying Musashi Otaru as well, considered small programs in Japan. The interesting thing about this data, um, that again, JASO put out, places like Aoyama Gakuin, Osaka Gakuin, Totsubashi, Meiji, Doshisha, Asia University, are not even listed in this data. <laughs> Okay, so again, this is where we get into this problem of who's reporting what, you know, where's the transparency, and, and do we really understand, do we really understand 
um, international education potential in Japan, right? Okay, so if we look at, I'm just, I just broke these down even further, okay? Um, and so again, Musashi and Otaru, uh, again, are kind of in that same range. Now, the data, the, the numbers that you see, to confuse you even further, <laughs> The numbers that you see in parentheses uh, come from another publication uh, that's done by Asahi. It's called the Daigaku Ranking. Okay, and this is data that was um, this was the Daigaku Ranking 2011 data. Okay, um, but you know that that was data that was collected in uh, from 2009, which actually meant it was from 2008. And we're talking about universities in 2011. It's all so confusing. <laughs> Right, but they only listed 70 institutions. Now, that number shows the total number of international students at a particular institution. So, for example, Senshu uh, in the Asahi was listed at 204 international students totally. Now, they run a smaller study abroad program of about 30 to 50 students. My point of bringing those numbers out again, particularly if we're looking at this 20, this 20 range where Musashi is listed with Nihon University. Musashi has a total of 30 investigated though, the less I knew, <laughs> I'm still very confused. I think we need to think about uh, the purpose of the data. Who really is the target? Because again, these numbers are out there in English, okay? I can speak Japanese well enough um, to be the same as Sean is a functionally illiterate in this country at this point. Uh, but, you know, again, somebody from abroad who isn't going to be able to really understand what these numbers mean, okay? Particularly when you go to a Japanese source and they don't quite match what you're seeing in English, that even lends to more confusion, okay? So this is another problem. Who is this data really for? Who is the target? Um, I think that what we need, hopefully, we can arrive to at some point, the, uh, the need for honestly reported, clearly defined, and transparent data, uh, if, if possible. And, you know, this, this speaks to a larger issue that I've come to, to find out more about as I've worked in international education, international education in Japan here. Um, there's not a lot of cooperation between Japanese universities, which I find personally kind of frustrating and, and, and very much um, a detriment to the overall health of international education in Japan. I mean, I think the international, well, I studied abroad uh, as a student. I was looking for a country where I could speak English. I studied in Amsterdam. Okay, I studied in Amsterdam. Um, I know all of that. Uh, but uh, at any rate, um, you know, it's, it's outside experiences as well that are very important. Um, but the thing is, you know, I often get emails or I often talk to people and they say, well, what about your program? And I say, well, no, you know, we really don't fit. But I know of this program here and here. And I actually give them other options. And I just wonder, does that ever happen at other universities? Are they really willing to share these students, because again, it's the overall, it's the country for an undergraduate. It's really the country that matters, right? As a graduate student, yes, you probably want to go to a Waseda. You want to go to a Todai as a grad student. For the most part, for the most part, as an undergraduate, you want to be in the country. And it doesn't matter if you're in Hokkaido, in Beppu, in Tokyo. You just want to be in Japan. And I think there needs to be a greater understanding of the network, okay? And the challenge that Japan faces, you know, as a study abroad destination overall. You know, we're, we're being passed over by China, okay? Uh, people want to go to China instead of Japan. And, and we, Japanese educators, are saying, wait a second, why are you jumping over us? But I think a lot of it has to do with we just don't talk to each other enough and promote the country versus our own uh, interests in that. And I think we, have to, we really have to come to a, a past that at some point. Um, another point is that if it's problematic to categorize incoming students, then what about the Japanese students going abroad? Right? I, think, I think we really need to look at, you know, there's a number of stories that have come out in the last two or three years, you know, the myth of the reluctant study abroad, disinterested Japanese student, you know. I really feel that at best it's under-examined and at worst it's, it's exaggerated, okay. Uh, and I say that because in the last two years, you know, we, we do an incoming student orientation. Um, I finally got on the ball and I started doing a survey uh, for our students. Uh, two years ago we had uh, 300 students that attended. These are incoming freshmen uh, at my university. And again, we only send out about 10 or 15 students. Now, 300 incoming students. My, my goal would be every single one of those students should be able to study abroad. 
okay, by the end of their four-year career. This year we had 500 students that came. Okay. In an era where the media is reporting it as that Japanese students are not interested in studying abroad. Okay. So again, we've got a disconnect, and, and that's why as an international educator, we have to be stronger advocates. We've got to get our own message out to sort of compete against that which is picked up uh, and nitpicked over, okay, and not really fully understanding the true scope of international education in Japan. Um, a quote I love is, is by uh, Dr. John Hudson. Uh, you don't know him either, <laughs> uh, but he's from Michigan State University. He's a professor of economics. He was the uh, former president of NAFSA. NAFSA is a large uh, international education association. Okay, it's a, it's a U.S.-based been uh, holding international conferences for 60 years, okay, that all U.S. institutions are members, uh, members from around the world, okay, so, you know, in international education, he was a pretty big, pretty big dude in some ways, right? Um, but he continues to point out that study abroad is a growth industry. We have to realize that. I can't recall what he's talking about in terms of how many students, students are going to be moving over the next 10 to 15 years, but it's it's a substantial increase, and we have to understand that. So there isn't this shrinkingness, okay? There is an interest to move around, and we are in that era of trading talent, right? We, we, we moved from industrial products, right? We moved from financial services. We're in the talent industry now, or, you know, the talent trading, okay, in some ways. Students need to have these global experiences, and we are in a growth industry, so that's that's very encouraging, and, and that's the final point of, of that data, is that students are moving, and I would say, let's not, let's not lose sight of the individual. That takes me uh, into what I hope is, is uh, less than uh, problematic in terms of processing at this point. Um, you know, influences on intimacy and isolation. Now, in my experience, I, I wear a number of hats, so to speak, okay? Uh, I'm not a trained counselor. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I play one in the study abroad world. Um, that's part of the job. Um, but you know, I, I think I do have some things to offer that others don't. I've you know, lived in Japan now for 20 years. I've studied abroad myself. I think that student coming in feels a little bit more relaxed, talking to me about a range of problems and issues than they would uh, a Japanese person. They don't want to come in and complain about the country to a Japanese person. They'd rather come in and complain about it to somebody who also has stories to tell them uh, on how he complains about the country too. So, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, you know, and also the fact that, you know, you, you probably do want someone in, in your native language, you know, when you're getting into really deep personal issues, which I've gotten into uh, over these last six years. Um, you know, personally, myself, after living here for 12 years, um, I've been in counseling. I've had to do that for my own mental health, okay? Uh, and I sought out an individual who has a license here in Japan as well as the UK. He's lived in Japan for 20 years. He speaks fluent British, <laughs> okay? Uh, because I tried a Japanese counselor first and there just was not a connection there. You know, there just was, he had also spent time abroad, but there just was something missing there. So I think at my university, we uh, finally hired uh, someone who can speak fluent uh, English, but she also is Japanese. I hope students will warm up to her. She's a great person. She's a great resource for my university. But I think for the first stop, for the first year, I tend to be that person. And so what I decided to do uh, during orientation over the last two years is uh, I bring the students in on a Saturday when nobody else is around. We do our culture shock and intercultural communication, intercultural competence uh, kind of a, uh, informational session. But before we do that, uh, what I'll do is I'll give them a blank piece of paper and say, okay, you've got two hours to find a quiet spot on our campus and just write how you're feeling. 